The Helicaster Jane Show airs Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern. The podcast always available online at helicasterjane.com. The way I see it, this world is worth a quiet laugh. It's nothing epic. It may be rates a paragraph. Life isn't always sunny, I agree. Even so, it seems funny to me. Oh, that sigh, Coleman. Wow. Thank you, Harbinger Records, for allowing us the use of these rarely heard Cy Coleman recordings you'll be hearing throughout the next 90 minutes. You are listening to The Hallie Caster Chain Show. And a special show this is as together we look back on the life and music of one of America's greatest composers, Cy Coleman. With me today, the author of the first comprehensive biography of Coleman, You Fascinate Me So, Andy Probst, and two performers who knew Coleman intimately, Lucy Arnaz and Michelle Lee. And I'll talk with the woman who captured the perennial bachelor's heart and married him late in life, Shelby Coleman. Andy Probst is a journalist and author whose career has encompassed work with New York Shakespeare Festival founder Joseph Papp and Tony Award-winning director George C. Wolfe, as well as five years on air at XM Satellite Radio's XM28 on Broadway Channel. His writing has appeared in The Village Voice, Time Out New York, Backstage, and The Sondheim Review, and he posts online at the site he founded, American Theatre Web, Dot com, as well as theatermania.com. He is currently editor-in-chief, curator for broadwaytunes.com, Broadway's digital music store. And he has written a show-stopping book, You Fascinate Me So, The Life and Times of Cy Coleman. Let's talk. So Andy, I have to tell you, I cannot rave about your book, You Fascinate Me So, The Life and Times of Cy Coleman, enough. Truly, this is the truth. I mean, you really put this story together. The research, in my mind, is just extraordinary. And it, it's about time, don't you think? Somebody did a story on Cy Coleman. Amazing that nothing has been done before, right? Uh, Allie, first off, thank you so much for your kind words about the book. I love and, this book. Yeah, I can't believe no one has told his tale before. I feel like the most privileged guy on earth to be the, the one to break ground. You are definitely that. I mean, listen to me. He is truly the genius music maker, maybe one of the all-time great genius music makers. He, he wrote more hits than any living American songwriter. So let's start with the beginning. That's always a good place to start. Talk to me about his early life. He wasn't born Cy Coleman, and it was clear early on that he was a child prodigy. You take it from there. Yeah, he was born Seymour Kaufman in the Bronx, and he came to music quite by accident. Uh, his mom, Ida, owned a tenement up in the Bronx that they lived in, and uh, at the height of the Depression, one of her tenants skipped out and uh, left behind a piano. They just couldn't get that out in the middle of the night. And what happened was Ida brought it into the house, and little Seymour at all of four started plunking out melodies that he'd been hearing. And believe it or not, the milkman heard him at the piano and said, you know, this kid needs piano lessons. And uh, when Ida wasn't going to have any of it, the milkman just brought over his kid's piano teacher. And she goes, yeah, this little boy needs them. And they struck a deal to get Seymour piano lessons. And before he was seven, he was winning uh, contests in the city, citywide contests with like 25,000 kids and playing at town hall. Hmm. Fascinating. His mom, this is what I got from, from reading this book of yours. I got that. He had a lot of voices in his head, a lot of it, most of it music. And I think his mother played in his head a little bit. She was a, she was a clever lady. There's no question about that. But do you think that this striving that he had to become something and somebody had to do with her? I think so. I think that there was a little bit of, I'm going to show you. And in the book, I talk about how it wasn't until he'd achieved a lot of success. He'd written songs that had charted for the likes of Sinatra and Tony Bennett. But it wasn't until Lucy was cast in one of his musicals that she thought, ah, my son, yeah, this could be a career for him. And so I think that there, there was some, I got to show my mom. By the way, she was a heck of a businesswoman, which he was as well. 
He was. Yeah. Uh, he had learned very early on the value of a dime. He had been earning money for himself since he was a teenager. And in fact, there was one point when I happened to run into Neil Sadaka, of all people. Hmm. And I said, did you ever cross paths with Cy Coleman? And he said, well, no, not really. But, you know, we had the same piano teacher, Adele Marcus. And she was always telling me that, you know, Cy, he's been earning money and supporting himself since he was a teenager. And indeed, that was the case. He bought himself his first grand piano, I believe, before he was out of high school. Wow. Wow. He, he started really, I guess, composing at 16. Kind of correlates with his changing his name from Seymour Kaufman to Cy Coleman, right? Yeah. He had then just begun that transition out of being a, a classical only pianist to one that was playing more jazz and pop music. And when he went to uh, one of the publishers to see about getting some work, the guy said, you know, well, first off, we need to, to change your name. And people call you Cy, right? And Cy said, yeah. And he goes, well, okay, well, Seymour is going to go down to Cy. And then, uh, well, with Kaufman, if we change it to Coleman, it won't sound like you're getting away from being Jewish too much. <laughs> That's how he uh, got Cy Coleman. And that was in the late 40s. And then I believe it was early 61 that the change was made official, that all the legal documents were filed. And that's how Cy Coleman became Cy Coleman. Here's something that's also, I, this, this whole story is compelling. It's really, in a way, a rags to riches story, but it's also the story of a, of a genius who actually makes good. Not all geniuses always make <laughs> Good, you know what I'm saying? I mean, this this guy was, was multifaceted to say the least. So much of his musical training, of course, was was classical, and and yet he heard all of these rhythms in this head of his. That was clear. Jazz, certainly. So talk to me about the Cy Coleman Trio. Well, the Cy Coleman Trio came to be after he had started achieving some success as a solo pianist in clubs. And he put together a trio right after he had made his debut at the Sherry Netherland. And that's when he really hit the charts as being a society, you know, cocktail pianist. And he wanted to do it at the Sherry Netherland. He was happy there and said to the owner, you know, listen, you've got a, a space downstairs. What if I put a trio in there and we play jazz downstairs? And the guy goes, no, 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 no. I like you upstairs. And, you know, the Vanderbilts are coming to listen to you. And so I said, what about you give me the downstairs? downstairs space or I quit. And indeed, he quit and put together a couple of other musicians. And that's when the Cy Coleman Trio was formed. It was uh, just at the top of 1950. And, and this thing from classical pianos to jazz, can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it, it's interesting because Cy talked about it in a couple of ways over the course of his life. He was first sort of introduced to it while he was in high school. One of his classmates said, you know, why don't you play in this dance band that I have? And that sort of stuck. And then Cy began playing more, and he said, in retrospect, at one point that it was just teenage rebellion, that he had enough of it. Another answer that he gave at one point, and I really like this, he said that uh, he wanted to be more creative than recreative. And so he found that in jazz... He could be exploring his own creativity. Musical influences. In those early years, he played with a lot of people. Talk to me about that, too. In those early years, he was uh, sometimes doing sit-ins up in Kutchner's. And um, tell you what Kutchner's is, because a lot of people may not know. The Catskills, his folks owned a bungalow colony that Jewish families could go up to and spend the summer. And while the Kaufmans wasn't all that exclusive or ritzy, right next door was Kutchner's, and that one was rit ritzy. And uh, so I would go over there and sit in with bands. And there he was playing with the likes of Daryl Sherman's dad, trumpeter. I think that he was really finding his musicality not so much in with whom he was playing, but whom he was playing. He would often say, and the Bergman said to me, that one of the reasons that Sai's music was so rich is that he had basically internalized all of the greats that had preceded him, by which they meant not just the classics, but uh, the Rogers of the world, the Porters of the world, the Gershwins of the world, uh, the Kearns. And if you look at the set lists that he had in clubs, they were all of the, the great American songbook tunes as we know them now. 
and he was beginning to embellish them. And I think one of my favorite stories about the way Cy could take another composer's music and make his own came from Sheldon Harnock, who, among other things, wrote the lyrics for uh, Fiddler on the Roof. And Sheldon told me that they'd all gotten together to celebrate uh, Burden Lane's birthday. And it was all of these composers from Broadway and lyricists. And the deal was that everyone had to sit down at the piano and give Burden Lane a present musically. And Sheldon told me that Cy sat down and did medley of variations of On a Clear Day You Can See Forever for about 15 or 20 minutes. And apparently it was the most extraordinary thing ever. And Sheldon said that if there's one crime that he thinks needs to be prosecuted, it's the fact that no one recorded what Cy did at the piano that night. Hmm, wouldn't that be something to have, right? Yeah. Oh my gosh, think about that. But there were people like Oscar Peterson, I, I think you, you mentioned in the book, I think Ella Fitzgerald were people who kind of crossed paths with him who yeah they, they crossed paths ella did give him some very good advice they were playing together at the bebop club and it's gerald said to him "Sai, you know you're playing too loud and you're never ever going to play louder or sing louder than me so just do it your own way i'd not realize that's where you were going but yeah that that's some of the advice he got the thing is is that Cy listened. As you said, he heard rhythms everywhere, and he would just pick things up. Another great story about him picking things up, it's in the book. He was working with Dorothy Fields in the late 60s. Now, at this point, Cy is just approaching 40, and Dorothy is beginning to push 70. And they're working on this musical, and he comes rushing into her apartment and announces that they're not going to be working. Instead, they've got to listen to something because it's really important. And he made her sit and listen to Sgt. Pepper. And I think that for someone who at that point was very well established, he'd written Sweet Charity and Little Me and Wildcat and Witchcraft and The Best Is Yet to Come to go, this is important. This Sgt. Pepper, this is showing us something. It, it tells you a lot about Psy. Absolutely. Very forward thinking, always. You can see that throughout his whole career. Let, let's talk about some of his collaborations. Let's start in the beginning. His first okay. collaboration was with Joseph Allen McCarthy Jr. Together they wrote, Why Try to Change Me Now and I'm Going to Laugh You Right Out of My Life. How, how did that first collaboration with that lyricist go? They were thrown together by Sai's publisher. And Sai at that point had written one tiny little musical that was produced out on Long Island. It was called You Gotta Regatta. And there, there's some thought that Sai should be writing songs. And so the publisher put them together and they came up with Why Try to Change Me Now. Oh, Why Try to Change Me Now was uh, recorded by Frank Sinatra. That is level, so I walk in the rain. I've got some habits even I can't explain. Could start for the corner and turn up in Spain. Why try to change me now? And there was talk for a while that they might work on a musical together, but it never happened. Part of the problem was that McCarthy had something of a drinking problem and was very, very slow. They worked together basically from about 1952 until 1956. And in those years, they did get Cy's first Broadway song. They wrote a tune called Tin Pan Alley that was part of John Murray Anderson's Almanac. And it was a big production number. And John John Murray Anderson was known for his spectacles. And actually, remember that movie, uh, The Greatest Show on Earth? Mm -hmm. He had done all of the circus acts in that because he'd actually also, in addition to his theater work, been working at Ringling Brothers. And so it gives you a sense of scale that this man of the theater could bring to a show. And if you look at pictures, it was big. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then they also wrote a number which is one of my favorites. Uh, it's actually, I've got a demo of it, and it's on a new CD. The Lady is Indisposed. Too much this, too much that, till I don't know where I'm at. Tell the gentleman that the lady is indisposed. That was written for blues singer Mae Barnes, and that was in a Ziegfeld Follies that just never made it into the city. So that was uh, the McCarthys. They had a lot of fun together, a lot of late night partying by all accounts. Another person who was palling around with them was a star in her own right, Veronica Lake, 
Yeah, great pictures, by the way, in the book of that. Love great that. pictures it, in the book, by the way. I was very lucky that Size Widow Shelby basically threw open the doors to me at Size Company, Notable Music, and her own files, and just let me pick and choose and tell this story. And I think that uh, the pictures really do show Size progression. I mean, some of those old cards from the, the nightclubs that he was playing. Right. Let's go to Carolyn Lee. Carolyn Lee. Oh, my gosh. Let me tell people who she was, because before she she got with Cy. She wrote things like, I got a crow, I'm flying, I, I won't grow up, young at heart. This was some collaboration. They, These guys just made gorgeous music together, didn't they? They did. And it happened quite by chance. Cy was never terribly retiring. And the story goes that one day in the Brill Building, you know, the center of Tin Pan Alley back in the 50s, you know, people were just hanging out there to create music. He said to her, or maybe she said to him, they never quite agreed on it. Why don't we write a song together? And okay, let's do it. And so they ran up and found an empty space in the building with a piano. And the course of a few hours wrote a song called Moment of Madness, inspired by the lunacy of just collaborating on the spot. And they took it to a publisher in the building who loved it and said, Sammy Davis has a gig coming up, a recording date. Let's send it to him. And sure enough, this first collaboration, Moment of Madness, was recorded by Sammy Davis Jr. And then, you know, they were off and running. And off and running is like uh, not even the beginning of the word. You know, <laughs> witchcraft? Talk to me about witchcraft. That was a song title that came Carolyn had in mind. She'd wanted to write a song with the title Witchcraft, Nothing More, Nothing Less. And, you know, as you said, she had worked with a number of other composers before Sai, but it wasn't until Sai that she thought she had a collaborator who could do something as magical, if you pardon the pun, as what she wanted for Witchcraft. And so she suggested it, and Sai sat down and wrote something that he thought was kind of appropriate, and she goes, no, 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 it needs to be something even more special. And ultimately, he came up with the melody that we know, which works kind of like she described it, an inverted pyramid. It doesn't work as a standard 32-bar song. And they sent it off to Sinatra. You know, both of them had had hits with Sinatra. And he recorded it. And the rest, as they say on that one, is history. Absolutely. But what's interesting is that if anyone wants to hear the bit of melody that Cy didn't use, it's actually on one of his later CDs, I think it's on It Started With a Dream, when he plays it, and you'll hear that witchcraft doesn't quite sound what you think it to be, and you can find it on there. Well, that's fascinating. Talk to me also about, oh my gosh, the best is yet to come. And I'm going to, for the sake of time, throw this in. Sinatra loved this song. It's the last song that he ever sang in public, and the best is yet to come is on his tombstone. I think that's gorgeous, but th talk to me about how that tune came that to tune, light. That uh, tune came about simply by virtue of the fact that Cy joked Carolyn could put uh, a lyric to an arpeggio. And she'd <laughs> been listening to him do this this piece very, very fast. And she goes, I want to write a lyric to that. And he said, no, you can't. There's just no way. It's too fast. No one will ever sing it. And she goes, well, slow it down a bit. And all of a sudden she sang uh, Out of the Tree of Life, I Just Picked Me a Plum. And they finished the tune. They sent it off to Sonata who liked it. He asked for an extension on it, which Cy dutifully created along with Carolyn. And again, he liked it. And then there was nothing. And about a year passed and Tony Bennett called up and said, hey, I I'd like a song like Witchcraft. I'd like a hit like that. And so I said, well, I've got something, but I promised it to Sinatra. Let me check. Sinatra said, no, Tony can sing it. And so that's how it came to be that Tony Bennett was the one who did the first recording. And what's interesting about it is that it's a moment when all of Cy's training comes together because Bennett decided to do it so quickly. He just farmed out an orchestration the night before the recording session. And when the orchestrator dropped it off, it was all wrong. And Cy rewrote the orchestration on the spot and conducted the orchestra. And so if you pull out the 45 of Tony Bennett singing The Best Is Yet To Come, what you'll hear is basically Cy working on the fly as both a pop musician and a classically trained one. Love it. You know what one of my favorites is? Which? The, the Playboy theme. The Playboy theme, yes. That, that First of all, let me tell you, one of the reasons I love, besides I'm a jazz freak, and that's certainly him at his best with jazz, but it's an era. And he captured that era probably even un unknowingly, mm -hmm. right? 
You go back yeah. to listen to that and you know where you are on that. You know that you're you're in for something very slinky and very sexy and very <laughs> smoky. Right. Mm. <laughs> it's it's so delicious. We we got to move on. I wish that we didn't but we're going to but but I, we move on to something really extraordinary and that's 1960 which is his first Broadway show Wildcat with Lucille Ball and that phenomenal song Hey Look Me Over. Hey Look Me Over. Let me and it out of clover, mortgage up to here, but don't pass the plate, folks, don't pass the cup. I tell you whenever you're down and out, the only way is up. Talk to me. Oh, he, he didn't know what to do for Lucy. Boy, if there was ever writer's block, it sounds to me like he was having it then. He was petrified of giving finding a song that would introduce Lucille Ball, then the biggest star in the country and the world, her Broadway, you know, this is Lucy singing. And uh, apparently Carolyn finally said to him, Cy, what if you didn't have to write for her? What if you were just writing an opening number? And he plunked something out on the piano and said, well, how about that? And they both laughed and moved on. A couple of days later, she goes, you know, I put a lyric to that. And she's saying, you know, hey, look me over, lend me an ear. And they laughed again. And they thought, well, why not? We'll, we'll, we'll throw this one out there we can rewrite. And their publisher, Buddy Morris, just loved it. And when it came time to play the entire score to Wildcat, Lucille Ball was just as nervous. And when she heard that, she kind of knew everything was going to be okay. Lucy Arnaz is the daughter of Hollywood royalty. Her mother, Lucille Ball, her dad, Desi Arnaz. But Lucy didn't let that get in her way. She built her own career with grit and grind acting in television and film, ultimately making her mark on Broadway in a host of productions beginning with the musical They're Playing Our Song, and included in her resume, headlining the first national tour of Cy Coleman's hit musical Seesaw. We talked recently. She shares her memories of Wildcat, her mom, and working with Cy Coleman. Have a listen. So, Lucy, first, you had a front row seat to history when your mom worked with Cy and Wildcat. You were just a kid, but you remember it, I know. Tell us about that. I do. I was about eight, eight and a half or so. And um, it was in, been a year in New York and when they were out of town in Philadelphia. And I remember I saw the show probably about 20 times, 17 or 20 times. I can't remember exactly. I don't know. I, as a kid, who, who knows what your memories were like? I remember that I loved the show. What did I know? So I just, I remember thinking that that's what I wanted to do when I grew up, was to have fun on stage like those days dancers did and jumping off of walls and and um, I have vir- virtually no memory of Cy at that particular time really because by the time I showed up I think he was kind of done with what he was supposed to be doing with the show because they were already on the road and I was eight who remembers I, I know that I, I met him again when I was about 24 and he he was uh, casting Seesaw for the national tour so that's really when I met Cy Coleman and 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 the national tour you did for him great great applause for your performance on the oh, tour well, on the first well, national tour anybody I asked about that said she was unbelievable in that role. Oh, Talk to me. Thank you. Well, you know what? It's it, you'd have to be really bad to not be good <laughs> in Seesaw because it's everything. It's one of the best roles for a woman ever written. And, you know, it was when it was two for the Seesaw to play. And then when they turned it into a musical and you've got Dorothy Field's lyrics and Cy Coleman music and Tommy Toon next to you and Michael Bennett directing, you'd have to be an idiot, you know. So to, for me, it was such a gift to have that be my very first vehicle that allowed me to get my equity card. So well, actually, I got my so, equity card in summer stock just before that. But that was my first real great job. And I loved that part. I loved loved the music from that show and he was no pushover either because even though he knew me from when I was a kid and he knew me as a you know the daughter of blah 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 I auditioned for him and I had to track him down after the audition and audition again because I was asked to audition in New York and I was asked to sing a ballad I was specifically asked to sing a ballad so I worked on this a ballad to give them and I sang it and I read a scene and and then I he they went away and I heard from my agent that no you didn't get it I said what like, how's that? No, that's not possible. No, 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 no. I am Gil Mosca. No, you don't understand. This is perfect part for me. They said, well, they all confabbed afterwards. Apparently, Michael, you know, Bennett likes you very much, but Cy's not sure that you can belt. And I went, what? What? They asked me to sing a ballad. Oh, my God. I thought they asked me to sing a ballad because they knew I could. Oh, this is terrible. No, you have to get me another audition. I, I became like a, a maniac, and I have the least ambition of any actor you've ever known, but I went crazy. It was like, no, no, this isn't right. There's a mistake. And it was Thanksgiving weekend. Everybody had left. Right after the audition, everybody left. They go disappear. There's no way you can get these people back, so forget about it. It's not going to happen. But I just badgered my agent until Eric Shepard, bless his heart, said, okay, okay, all right. 
I'm going to call. I'm going to call somebody. I know who to call. And word came back that Cy would agree to hear me sing again two weeks from now in Los Angeles. So I thought, well, that's a good sign. That means they're not in a hurry to cast this. And so I went back to L.A. and I worked like a dog, you know, on every big belty song I could find. And he came to the house of my singing teacher at the time, and we sat him in the living room, and I sang him one song after another. <laughs> so he finally started screaming, "Okay!" Okay, you can play Gittle. <laughs> yeah, this is so you. Let me tell you, you didn't hear what I said in the intro, but in the intro I said that you're the daughter of Hollywood royalty, you know, your mom, Lucy, and, and Desi. And I said, but that never got in your way. <laughs> it's well, true. you know, there are just certain things that you fight for, and that was, right? I was determined to fight for that. I just thought, no, there's plenty that I'm not right for, but I am so totally right for this. And and if they had said, well, we know that you think you're right for it, but we don't like the way you think. But because they said what they said, I knew that that wasn't going that that's not fair. So I have to try again and then then tell me I'm not right for it. So it was great because I was right. I would sing it. And, and I spent six of the best months of my life on tour with that show. I had the best time of my life. And I have to tell you something very funny. One of my absolutely favorite YouTube vids ever in the history when i get depressed this is where i go oh, i know you know him like this. Say. you know, you know them. Uh, darling the two of you are so shelly and i at, at birdland that night at my show at birdland and it was called lucy's birthday bash at birdland and so i got other people up with me to do funny stuff just to get up and off the cuff do stuff and we literally never rehearsed that for one second i told her when we were sitting in the audience i said look before i go on let's do this you know i'm thinking it might be something like this and then you start and then i'll you know we'll just, she goes look oh, don't say another word. I know exactly what to do. And I said, okay, then let's just play with it. And that's what happened. It was magic. Magic, magic. is exactly right. It could be a, t- it's a TV pilot. It's so funny. It's, it's extraordinary. It really, really is. But you know, here's something that I wanted to ask you about that, because that song, Nobody Does It Like Me, mm. that song brings something out in every woman who, not everyone, you and she, <laughs> because I've seen some bad renditions, but right. you and she, what did he put in there? What, vamp, what is that? What, what did it touch in your core, the two, that you can, that it just, it makes you be something? What is it? Oh, you know? well, I mean, I think we all go through a period in our lives, usually a lot younger than we are now, where we just think, I'm a total screw up. I can't do anything right. I pick all the wrong guys if I want to screw, you know, nobody screws it up like I can screw it up. That's basically what the song's about. And I think the beat yourself Jewish girl, you know, beat yourself up Jewish girl was a line that we always used to say and I'm not Jewish but I totally relate to that <laughs> it's just kind of a beat yourself up when there's no need to be beating yourself up and uh, that's what that song is about and it, it touched a core with all the girls who were like Gittle I mean Gittle says to Jerry Ryan my name is Gittle that means things will fall apart <laughs> He thinks right. her whole name means things will fall out. You know, I mean, that's just the way you look at yourself. And the arc of her story is that at the end, she says, I'm good enough for him, but I'm leaving anyway. But she makes a decision that it's not that she's not good enough. He's not good enough for her. And that's huge. Something about that melody, too, though, right? Fun to sing. Yeah, he wrote another song that is very much like it. You can always count on me and nobody mm-hmm. does it like me. It's almost the exact same song. But, you know, Cy said, "When steal from yourself. <laughs> Steal from the best, uh, steal from yourself. A you great can line. sing those two songs as a counter melody because they're almost the identical same song. If there's a wrong way to say it, a wrong way to play it, nobody does it like me. So listen, this is this is trivia. I don't know if this is true or not, but I had to ask you about this because I was told by a certain somebody who I'm not allowed to say who it was that a little birdie told him that Lucy Arnaz and Cy Coleman wrote a song together and that you're actually in the copyright oh, yeah. office. Is that yeah, true? We that did. Is? What? Yeah, we did. Well, by that time, I was friendly with Cy and, and had worked with him a lot. And um, my mother was doing her last series called Life with Lucy and for ABC. And I said, I was writing songs at the time. I'd written several songs, lyrics and stuff. And I said to her, I said, can I take a crack at writing the theme song if you don't already have one? And she went, oh, sure. What a great idea. That's a great idea. So I did. And I wrote a lyric and I liked it. It was called, she keeps getting better all the time. And she said, who do you think should write the music? And I said, well, I would like to take it to Cy. And, and he loved it. He was so gracious. And I thought, oh, you're just saying that. He goes, no, this is a good lyric. I can do that. This is great. 
And I said, it should be a typical side, jazzy, you know, tempoed thing, and we'll do like a full version, and then we'll do an opening version, because the opening of the show is always shorter. And they absolutely loved the song. We figured we'll get Mel Torme to sing it, because she adored Mel. And the next thing I know, Aaron Spelling had brought in another duo and played a song that he knew from somebody who wrote it, and they gave it to Gary Morton, my stepfather. And Gary hired those people, recorded it with Edie Gourmet, and never told us. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> and I had to go to Cy Coleman and say, we've been fired. They hired someone else. They fired Cy Coleman. I mean, what kind of crazy people do that? They hired two people who didn't have Cy Coleman's name or anything else, and they wrote this little jingle of a song, which Edie Gourmet, bless her heart, because I love Edie and so do they, recorded. And it was okay. It was a jingle, kind of an opening number. And uh, But I mean, it's a funny story for my book someday. But I did. I wrote a really terrific song with Cy Coleman called She Keeps Getting Better All the Time. Have you ever recorded it or sung no. it in, in public? I've sung it in public, yeah. I've sung it in yeah. my club act to, to make people laugh. Oh, i got to go see if I can find it. Uh, is that on YouTube? We've got to go find that. No, folks. God, no. No, 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 no. It's never been it's never been recorded, recorded, and it's never been videotaped. Okay, I'd we'll love to it. hear that, darling. I'd love to hear that. It's a good song. I believe it's a you. It's good song. I'm very, I'm very <laughs> proud of it because I came in, you know, saying, please tell me if this – Lyric sucks, or if it's not good enough, I'll, I'll tweak it. He never made me change a word. So wow, that's flattered. so cool, though. I mean, yeah. Right? I mean, that is really yeah. cool to have on your resume. I wrote a song with Con Cy Coleman. Oh, my God. Oh, my you God. You think I would Listen, be I gotta smart go with, to I gotta put it go. on my resume. It's not on my resume. Well, it should be on your resume. That's, like, too cool for words. So, listen, <laughs> last question, because, I mean, I'm like, oh, I wrote my God. I wrote a song with I'm Marvin Hamlish, too. Maybe I could do a whole album of songs I've written with other people. <laughs> really? That's funny. It'd be a very that's short funny. album, but maybe a couple of crap. No, but you know what? That would be really cool. You in New York, I mean. Right, you've been doing a lot of club work, cabaret stuff. You're fabulous. I've been doing well, a lot the of songs club work all over the country and all over the world, actually, since 1988 when I put. I got to give you credit, you know, I really do. I and first of all, I always thought you were so incredibly talented, and what a voice you did right. get. You're quite welcome, absolutely. One last thing, Sai, one word. If you had to say, sum him up, because you knew him so well. Talk to me. What's the one word? A uh, one word. Oh, I hate these questions. Yeah, I know. I'm asking Lucy on this. Yes That's really a terrible question. <laughs> That's cruel. <laughs> All right, I'll give you three. <laughs> it's hard. And that's when people say, I hate, but I'm always terrible with those questions. You can't, what's my favorite color? What's your favorite song? What's, what's yeah, I don't give a hoot about your favorite this? color. I go, that's impossible to freaking do. But if I you say know, to you seriously, Cy Coleman, what do you say? What, what is, what is, uh, what's the bottom line on him in terms of how you feel about him, think about him, remember him? Infinity genius. That's two words. Wow, that's it, his heavy. genius never stopped. Dro he had to drop dead, they, you know, because there was no way to get him to quit. He always had things cooking, working, and I mean working, like it's not things in the works, working, like working, and they always worked. <laughs> Right. He was one of the most talented people I ever met. He and Marvin Hamlish together, I want to say, you know, staggeringly talented and so freaking nice. Just adored right. this man. Miss him all the time. You can be getting swept off your feet by a real live girl. Up next, we get to two of my favorite songs. I just love Real Life Girl and I've Got Your Number mm -hmm. from Little Me with Sid Caesar, on which they collaborated with a little known playwright by the name of Neil Simon. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. There's a style emerging here and I think we should talk about that. Can it be defined? I don't think a style can be defined simply by virtue of the fact that, you know, there, there's jazz undertones and there, there's bringing of jazz to Broadway particularly in Little Me, in ways that had not been part of the Broadway musical beforehand. I think that in Real Life Girl, there's a little bit more continental flair because of the fact that the heroine spends some time in Europe, whereas Wildcat takes place in the Southwest. The style is that the music is always surprising. There's always a harmonic shift that just doesn't feel like it should be in there. And with Carolyn, there's a playfulness that is slightly sly. I think one of my favorite lyrics it comes from Little Me, which is when the heroine singing at the very top, she says she's going to sit and fan on her fat divan while her butler bottles the tea. <laughs> <laughs> and Andy, knowing you as I know you, I get why you love that. <laughs> it's so fun. So it's fun. It's so fun. Right. What it does is it tells you everything you need to know about the character. She thinks that butler, buttle is a verb. Right, right. And that's just so darn clever. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. Butler. 
daddy started out in San Francisco, tooting on his trumpet loud and mean. Suddenly a voice said, go for daddy, spread the picture on the widest screen. And the voice said, brother, there's a million pigeons ready to be hooked on new religion. Hit the road, daddy, leave your common law wife. Spread the religion of the rhythm of life And the rhythm of life is a powerful beat Put a tingle in your fingers and a tingle in your feet Rhythm in your bedroom, rhythm in the street Yes, the rhythm of life is a powerful beat So let's get to 64 when he finally meets Dorothy Fields yeah. And they meet at a party There's a whole lot of Broadway folklore around this one Tell us the real story The, the folklore is everything that you've heard That they were at a party together It was a composer due on the Upper West side. I believe it was at Dorothy's house, in fact. And he just walked up to her and he said, how'd you like to write a song together? And she said, and she actually quoted this one too, thank God you asked. And he was really surprised because here's a woman whose career dated back to 1928. And, you know, at this point, Dorothy is a woman who's written songs like On the Sunny Side of the Street, The Way You Look Tonight. And he goes, why? Don't 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 people come up to you all the time and ask this? She goes, no, I guess they're scared. So <laughs> she and, was the queen. She was the queen. I, I mean, and she had broken ground in terms of women in musical theater. But that's another another story. In any event, they agreed on it. And then about a year later, Bob Fosse said, hey, I've got a, a, a show. I want you to write some music for me, Cy. And Fosse said, who do you want to write the lyrics? And Fosse said, said, well, what about Dorothy Fields? And Fosse had worked with Fields on a previous musical, and they said, yeah, that makes sense. And thus, the team of Cy Coleman and Dorothy Fields was born. And what a unbelievable beginning, Sweet Charity. Again, Neil <laughs> Simon, as you said, the uh, Bob Fosse, Gwen Verdon, songs like Big Spender, and If My Friends Could See Me Now. This is a classic. Th- this never grows old, the show, right? It never grows old, and it also is the moment when Cy hits his stride as a businessman. I mean, not only is he churning out these tunes, he is making sure that before Sweet Charity opens in late 1965, that there are 14 45s on the market of the songs. So Tony Bennett is singing Baby Dream Your Dream. Peggy Lee is singing Big Spender. Barbara Streisand is singing You Want to Bet, and You Want to Bet didn't even end up in the show. <laughs> and I think that's one of the reasons it so endures, is the, these tunes have become part of our musical DNA. And again, you know, he does something with his women characters that, I don't know, the way that he writes a tune and the way that his women sing those tunes astonishes me. He was very smart. Uh, David Zippel, who wrote City of Angels with him in the late 80s, said Cy was a musical dramatist. And that, that came out of after my saying, you know, how, how did Cy set a joke so well? And David said he was a musical dramatist. And I think that the music, as jazzy as it is, as kind of just so easy, it picks up on who the, these people are. And then when you have lyricists that understand women, and naturally, Carolyn Lee, Dorothy Fields, you put it together, and all of a sudden you've got these incredible songs for women that just express it, and it's the perfect marriage of lyric and music. No question about it. And and I think a, a great example of that is uh, in 1973 with Seesaw, a show mm-hmm. that began with a very rocky beginning. Talk to us about the rocky beginning. The rocky beginning. Seesaw, it's based on William Gibson's two-character play, Two for the Seesaw, about this uh, woman, Jewish woman from the Bronx, who wants to be a dancer, and she meets this just-separated attorney from Nebraska who's moved to the city to start over again and they fall in love and let's just say it doesn't end well in any event it had originally been cast with Ken Howard who's now the president of SAG-AFTRA and Lainey Kazan and they got it out to Detroit and uh, it wasn't working it just wasn't working and producers called in a young director choreographer who was just beginning to make his mark a guy by the name of Michael Bennett somebody go on to create something called a chorus line <laughs> and he came in and said I will do this as long as I have complete control. And he started refashioning that show from top to bottom. That included getting rid of the female lead and Michelle Lee came in to take it over and she and can both talk about the incredible work that Bennett did while he was rehearsing the new version of Seesaw during the day and the company, God love them, were all performing the old version at night. 
and having to keep the two separate. And the show came into New York in the spring of 73, and it was warmly received. So I always wondered if they'd kept it out of town a little bit longer, if it might have gotten even better. But it proved to be a remarkable success in that it did end up running for nearly a year. It made it through into 74. Cy Coleman once said, Michelle Lee is a surefire powerhouse performer. She embraces a lyric like nobody can. An Emmy Award nominee and a two-time Tony nominee, one nod was for her performance as the quirky and lovable Gittle Mosca in the Coleman Fields musical Seesaw, for which she won the Drama Desk and the Outer Critics Award for Best Actress. Lee has been a favorite of audiences since she caught their attention in the 50s TV mega-hit the Many Loves of Dobie Gillis. She made her Broadway debut and had to succeed in business without really trying. She joined us in our living rooms as Karen Fairgate on the long run of the nighttime soap opera Knott's Landing. The headlines never stop for Michelle Lee, who just wound them in New York at 54 Below with her Cy Coleman show. Nobody does it like me. Michelle, yeah. let me just say that before there was a Kelly O'Hara, are you listening to me, my friend? Before there was a Christian <laughs> Genoa, there was Michelle Lee. I'm just saying. Oh. I'm just saying. Oh. So, Michelle. Just saying. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, listen to me, though. I really wanted to talk to you about Cy Coleman. And yeah. before we do that, I want to give you my observation. And let me hear what you have to say. If something happens to a woman performer when she sings a Cy Coleman song, that's my observation. It's like from the outside looking in, it's as if his tunes, I don't know, touch like almost the very core of a woman's soul and yet tug at the heart of the girl inside as well, that they were at once funny and sad, his songs. They're tough. They're gentle. They're sweet. They're bittersweet. And there are a few who sing his songs as well as you do. So talk to me about singing a Cy Coleman. Coleman song. You know, you're, you, that is so poignant what you're saying, and I get a lump in my throat because I love the man so much. You know, because when we were working together, when I was doing Seesaw on Broadway in the 70s, uh, we had such a short period of time to get the show together. So he became like my master, and he'd always be with me, almost seeing this imaginary baton in his hand over my head. <laughs> <laughs> You're so right about what he does with his female characters. So many of them are what I like to say, the women who love too much or the, the women with the charitable heart, you know, women who get stepped on and, until they get it, you know, until they find their life lesson. And so many of the things that you hear from him have this background, certainly in his uh, musicals like Sweet Charity. You know, here's a woman who is just trying to do the best she can to get along, and she's doing everything right to love people, but everything wrong to love herself. And Gittle Mosca, who I played in, Two for the, in the adaptation of Two for the Seesaw, was much like her. Of course, it was done at a time where people were making love <laughs> at the drop of a hat. And this woman that I played was just looking for love, and so she tried to make everybody happy. <laughs> <laughs> and find any excuse to have the man of the hour to be with her. And, of course, you know, the song, and I sing it in the Cy Coleman show at 54 Below, nobody does it like me. You know, I try to be a lady. <laughs> I try to do the right thing. You know, I try to pick up the right fork and the, and the right knife at the appropriate time. But somehow food falls on me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and that's, of course... That's, of course, not in the song, but the song is kind of saying that she can't, she can't quite get it all together. You know, nobody does it like me. I've got a big, fat mouth, and things just fall out of it. You know what I love? I love in the show that I'm doing, the Cy Coleman show, is that I get to do that. Part of my personality is that I open my mouth and things fall out of it. <laughs> you I, too, huh? <laughs> I, I just love seeing that audience, and if I start talking to him forget it yeah no I just I, it also this weekend is well it's Thursday it starts on Thursday but it's Cy Coleman's birthday weekend right. and so uh, yeah and so it he would have been 86 and I just I miss him so much I miss his smile and his warmth and his unbelievable talent because if people really understand what this man was musically they know that he was a magician with notes on paper and of course did everything from his concert yet uh, his piano at age four hello that went to 
Carnegie Hall and, and all over the country winning all, or the world, I should say, in winning contests at this very young age and then became so involved with uh, jazz. I got to tell you a funny story. Can you tell me? Because I, so I introduced my friend to Cy Coleman backstage after a show and I say, this is, I'd like to introduce you to Cy Coleman. And my friend said, oh, that's so funny. You're not going to believe this, but there's this guy who has a jazz trio and and he I collect all of his records and he has your name. He said, Well you just shook his hand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like right. because you know Cy Coleman as this showman who sure. uh who has written all these incredible musicals. That's what he ultimately became known for. But of course the popular song, the witchcraft and the uh, Firefly and everything else that he ultimately wrote uh, is part of him, including the Playboy theme, Hello. You know, when he was, he knew Hugh Hefner, he became the jazz trio on Hugh Hefner's late night show, whatever it was called. And he wrote the Playboy theme, which when people hear it, they know it. And it was an instrumental. And so many incredible different kinds of songs that I had no idea he wrote. And so what I'm trying to do also, because that incredible book just came out, you know, Andy's book, mm -hmm. Andy Prope's book, uh, about Cy Coleman, uh, not only did was I able to tell some stories about Cy that they used in the book, but wow, there's so many unknown things about Cy Coleman's that I used to put in my show. Are you taking the show on the road? Well, I am going to do it at the Kennedy Center. Uh, oh, I am not yeah. going to do it on the road because I am, in fact, going into, and I can't tell you what it is, and I love saying this to someone who's on this, but I am going into a Broadway show. And so I'm not taking it on the road, but I did get off to do the Kennedy Center, which was already booked. And I'll do it there. I'm Very soon. in a couple of days. Yeah, right after 54 Below. Oh, God, I'm so excited. Yep. You're not going to you're not going to yeah. whisper to me and, and tell me I can't. You know why I can't? Because I've been sworn. And they said if they don't get to release it first and it comes out via Twitter or someone just <laughs> telling kill their you. mother, oh, I talked to someone, then I'm dead. But this show, the, the Cy Coleman show, oh, forget it. It is, it's a little miracle. And I feel, Cy, whenever I giggle, my character in, in CISA, I always say when I giggle, I feel him above me. Uh -huh. kind of not looking down at me, <laughs> but <laughs> kind of holding my hand with my music. <laughs> You know what you are, you're you're so delightful that I feel your energy right through the airwaves, darling. You are the best. Oh. No, seriously, and you better come back. I want to do an hour with you oh, sooner. I will definitely. Okay. The best I wish is yet to come. <laughs> Sadly, Dorothy Fields passed away in 1974, and Coleman went on to work with Michael Stewart. And I love my life, my wife. <laughs> I like. I do love my life. I love my. <laughs> I love my wife. You, anything you want to say on that on that one? Uh, I think that uh, with I Love My Wife, the one fun thing is that if you listen to the cast album of that, you can hear in one show how incredibly diverse I can be because it's like running uh, the dial on an old AM radio up and down and up and down because there's a song about every genre in there. You've got a country western. You've got barbershop quartet. You've got uh, mid-70s smooth pop. And it still all sounds like it's part of the same canvas. And then an interesting collaboration with Betty Condon and Adolph Green. Oh, my God, talk about talent. They produced a show that happens to be currently on Broadway at, at the moment. Yes. At, they, on the they, 20th they century. Together and wrote something called On the 20th Century. And uh, again, this is a wonderful marriage of this point, size knowledge of the musical theater and his classical roots, because he did not want to do this musical to start. Uh, they'd all talked about it, and it's a musical set on a train in the 30s, and he was worried that he was going to be have to write a whole bunch of 1930s-sounding songs, and that just didn't interest him. And Sai's method of working was very improvisational. He loved being with his collaborators and talking it out and hashing it out at the keyboard. And there came a point in time that he and and Betty and Adolph were together, and he played something very grandiose. And these characters, and on the 20th century, this theater producer and this big Hollywood star played to perfection by Kristen Chenoweth in the revival, might I say. They're overblown. 
And all of a sudden, they realized, wait a minute, we need to write, like, comic opera. And so I had loved playing Rossini when he was studying classics. And so all of a sudden, they'd found their musical vocabulary from the 20th century and were off and running. We've said this before. I'm going to say it again, which is that every style of music fascinated this guy. That's clear. He just understood all music. And we said he understood business, which I assume he got from his mom. But here's an interesting bit of trivia. You know, he he's fascinating, Andy, I guess, in the largeness of his vision. Could you understand what I'm saying with that? In 1970, for instance, he produced a single lying here for the rock opera sensations and it took a full page ad in Billboard magazine to promote his upcoming star vocalist, Steve Leeds singing. I mean, think about that. Who does that? Who And then, right? It's extraordinary. And uh, since you bring this up as we're talking on the 20th century, you know, he was actually publishing through his company, this rock opera sensations that was based on Romeo and Juliet. And the Times critics said that this score was actually a better theater rock score than Hair, if you can believe it. Tony Bon Jovi, who was a record producer and engineer and, yes, incidentally related to John Bon Jovi, would work with Cy in the studio and Cy was always taking him music, saying, hey, can, how can this become something more current? How, how can we get people to hear it? And with On the 20th Century, he took some of it in and they refashioned two of these very big operetta like songs into disco hits. Well, not hits, but into disco covers. And if you actually look on YouTube for Never by the Body Shop, you can find the disco cover of Never from On the 20th Century. And on the other hand, he once wrote a song, Don't F Around, (laughs) with your (laughs) mother-in-law. Yeah. He wasn't afraid to be non-PC. That was from a show about a bunch of guys caught in alimony jail called Welcome to the Club that had a very brief run on Broadway in 89, in the spring of 89. Uh, yeah, he, he, he would do just about anything, and he was not afraid. I think that's one of the things that I came to feel about him as I was working on the book, was his utter fearlessness in his music and in his career. A large dark hard bark in the park. They say he's missing from the zoo. And the police are looking high and low. And they have not seen him, have you? Why did he go? Oh, I'll tell you the reason. Cause it's hard bark mating season. So he moves on to a show called Barnum. Uh, Mark Bramble, directed and choreographed by Joe Layton, with scenic design by David Mitchell and costume design by Theoni V. Aldridge, who, oh, one of the tops, starring Jim Dale and Glenn Close. Well, what's your feeling on that show? I wish I'd seen it. I wish I'd seen it when it was originally done. I I was in love with it when I was a kid. I could play that album over and over and over and over again. The original staging was so environmental, it actually began on the street outside the St. James on Broadway. And when you walked in, they'd had Ringling bring in all of this ephemera, and you were taken through a tour of P.T. Barnum's life before you got into the theater where there were circus acts happening as you were waiting for the show to start. And Glenn Close very early in her career, was sitting up in a box looking down very disapprovingly on it all because she played Barnum's wife, who was not as colorful as he was. And I think that Cy wrote some of the happiest music, and there's a lot of happy in Cy's music, but those chases, he said he loved writing chases, and he wrote a lot of circus chases for Barnum. Great show. Phenomenal show. It's an interesting show, as is City of Angels, by the way. I, oh, right? How, how did he and David Zippel get together, who, by the way, also wrote The Goodbye Girl, just for, to give him uh, some perspective to listeners? Jeez, talk to me. Okay. And David also wrote uh, Hercules. Right. Even more perspective. David is somebody who was trained as an attorney, but always wanted to write lyrics. And he had uh, written a whole bunch of songs with a guy by the name of Wally Harper. And it was part of the community. Community. And a number of people in Cy's life kept saying, you've got to work with this guy. You've got to work with this guy. And as David himself told me, you know, Cy felt too many people's fingerprints on it. And so he wasn't really all that interested. And there was a musical that Cy was working on that he thought, well, maybe this, maybe we'll work with him on this. And he brought David in, said, how'd you like to work with me on, on the, 
wasn't thus and such musical. And David was a little less than interested, but he also knew that he had an incredible opportunity in front of him. And he said, well, you know, I'm not totally interested in what you're asking me about, but I've heard about this detective noir musical you're working on. I think I'm right for that. And Sai had been working with Larry Gelbart mm. of MASH fame on the book for this and said, well, you know, listen, we're probably going to be looking for somebody a little more high profile to complete the creative team. But let me think on it. And Sai ultimately said, OK, write three songs with us and then we'll decide whether or not to move forward as a team. And David took that that audition, as it were, and uh, got the gig after writing three of the songs with Sai and Larry. And for that one. Uh, as I said, it was a, a detective story that was told from two perspectives, both from the perspective of a movie that's happening and from the perspective of the novelist whose story is being adapted into this movie. And Sai created the jazziest score that he ever created for Broadway for City of Angels. Again, it was a character in the show. And won a lot <laughs> Awards. It won a lot of awards. It got Cy his second Tony. Right. And it, it had James Naughton and Randy Graff, who picked up a Tony for it, and Greg Edelman and Rachel York and Dee Hody. I mean, it was beautiful. And Robin Wagner's sets, which were both color for the movie version and black and white for the novelist side. And Robin actually made it look like a movie was unfolding at times. See, this is just him, right? You go from that film noir sexy, jazzy kind of thing to the Will Rogers Follies, which was fantastic. It was fantastic. Again, yeah. Comden and Green, choreographed by Tommy Toon, directed by Tommy Toon, the original cast, Keith Carradine, in his heyday, gorgeous, Tony Award for Best Musical. And didn't Gregory Peck lend his voice to that? Yes, he did. He was Ziegfeld. He was the one controlling it all. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Speak. <laughs> Tell me more. What I love about, since we're starting with Gregory Peck, I'll just start there. That was a very important part of this musical because initially Peter Stone had not wanted to do a bio musical about Will Rogers. And Tommy had felt the same way. But it was Peter Stone who said, you know, what if we were to do it like a Ziegfeld show. And that way we're not hamstrung by having to tell it linearly, or if we fudge, we can fudge openly. And so, for instance, when it's time for Will Rogers to meet his bride, Ziegfeld doesn't like where it happened. So he sets it on the moon, and all of a sudden a moon set comes in, and D. Hody comes down, you know, looking all so glamorous. And for this, Psy did get to write pastiches. He was writing all the different kinds of songs that you would hear in his Ziegfeld Follies. So he wasn't hamstrung because it could be, you know, all of these different sounding songs for the different kind of acts that were in a folly show. And it was gorgeous. It was absolutely a gorgeous thing. Uh, that was Tony Walton's designs. And I guess Willa Kim, I believe, did the, the costumes. And just fun. And, you know, Cy, inventive to the nth degree. The big ecological number, Look Around, that was written at the 11th hour. In fact, it doesn't even show up in the opening night play bill. That's how late it was put into the show hmm. and ended up running. I think it's his longest running show. Yeah. Fabulous, fabulous, fabulous show. He had another hit following it with The Life. That was the one that I think he personally felt strongest about getting to Broadway. And I don't even think it was a think. He spent 10 years of his life making sure this happened. It was a story about 42nd Street before it got cleaned up. And it was about the, the hookers and the pimps and the drug addicts who were, you know, oh so present on 42nd Street. And for this one, he pulled out all of his R&B and gospel and funk sounds yes and he he got it on it was sheer will for this he had sam harris as the the iago like villain who put everything in motion and set this musical towards its tragic end and i think that it might be the closest that Cy came to writing something like porgy and bess because there's so much underscoring and there's so much recitative in it that you know sung dialogue that it has a scope and a feel of being like a modern porgy and bess fascinating what was his final foray for the stage you know, at the, the time he passed away there were 
one, two, three, four, five shows all in development in different stages of development, ranging from a musical about the life of Grace Kelly, which had been done in Amsterdam in Dutch. And on the night he passed away, he was actually talking with A.R. Gurney about doing the English translation of the book. And he'd had conversations with the Bergmans about translating the lyrics. He also had with the Bergmans, like jazz, which had just been done out in California to great acclaim. It was a, a kind of a pictorial history of jazz in a very loosely told framework. And there's still hope that that one will come. He was working with David and uh, Wendy Wasserstein on a musical adaptation of Pamela's first musical, her kid's book, about a little girl whose aunt introduces her to Broadway. And that one should be seeing the light of day next fall. And then uh, finally a musical version of Napoleon's life story and his love affair with Josephine that Larry Gelbart and David Zippel and Cy were working on. <laughs> I love it. I want to make clear, we focus mostly on his Broadway career, but this guy was far more than Broadway. He scored for films as well, yes? Yes. He did a little tune that a lot of people of a certain age will know. He, he wrote a song for Father Goose, Pass Me By. He also did, uh, right after that, uh, the full score for a movie that's long forgotten. It's called The Art of Love. It starred, get this, Dick Van Dyke, uh, Jim Garner, Elkie Summer, and Angie Dickinson. Whoa. And there was so much music in this little 90-minute uh, screwball comedy set in Paris that the music actually was more uh, voluminous than that for Spartacus. Wow. That's how much music Cy wrote. And it was so extraordinary that uh, when it came time to do an album they didn't do a soundtrack album they actually did a full orchestral version of all of the different songs that were underneath it it's an extraordinary thing to find on LP, and I believe it's on release on Kritzerland if people want to hear it on CD. He also did television. He did specials with Shirley MacLaine, right? He, he did, did two, two specials right. with Shirley MacLaine. That's what got him a couple of Emmys to go alongside uh, those Tonys of his. And he came to that simply by virtue of the fact she said, I need some help putting together uh, an act I'm doing in Las Vegas. And he thought it was going to be a phone call, and as he said, it became a couple of years of my life. Ultimately, those shows came to Broadway, or one of them did. She toured with them internationally. And there are in his files any number of other treatments for television that he was working on with various collaborators over the years. So he was always up for trying just about anything. And, and I want to say this. The television was not something that was foreign to him. He was one of the very early people in TV. Indeed, he was. Talk uh, about that. He was on a show on the Dumont Network, the, the network that uh, we've all forgotten, back in 1950-1951 called Date in Manhattan. And it was broadcast live at 11 a.m. every day from Tavern on the Green. And near as I can tell, it was a combination of the Today Show, The View, and a variety show. And Cy was there to do the live music with his trio. And that made for some interesting uh, mornings because he was also still doing his nighttime gigs in the clubs. So he was basically working a 24-7 schedule. Workaholic, no question about it. And, and that takes me to something that we haven't discussed, and that was his private life. True love came to Cy Coleman late in life. He married Shelby Brown, a girl who had done everything from writing romance stories to surveying roads in Idaho. They were an unlikely couple, you will soon discover, but clearly a match made in heaven. Shelby how when did you meet him? What a great story this is. Well, I was in Mexico in San Miguel de Allende. I was living there. I was writing a book, and I was living with my sister. And we didn't have much truck with the gringo community there. But my sister did know a few people, and we would go check emails and stuff like that at this little cafe. And there was this guy there named Ronnie Mallory. Ronnie's a, an artist. He's a great artist. Hangs in the Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art, as a matter of fact. And he asked me if I would be a date for him to go to a party. And I said, well, I don't really go out, and my family's visiting for Christmas, and I just really don't want to go. He goes, please, 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 please go. And I said, really, I don't want to come. And he, after a while, he talked me into going. Uh, and he was Cy, one of Cy's very best friends. And Cy was visiting him. So I went to a party and sat next to Cy. There was about 15 other people there. And he was with another girl. And we just talked. And I just, I just was so happy to talk to a person who was not expat, you know, who was 
had some brains who had a head on his shoulders who was funny and he was he was just such a delight and I loved talking to him and so much so we were laughing and having such a good time that the host of the party got a little nervous and decided we should move places and got us apart because I had a girlfriend there <laughs> <laughs> anyway so we had a really good time a few like three or four nights of these and we I kept meeting him and it was wonderful and so I kept going back because I had such fun with him and then the last night, we got into a bit of an argument, and I didn't know that Cy was a musician. He hadn't talked about his job or anything, and they started talking about rap music. They said, well, rap music's not music. And I said, well, to the people who do it, that probably is music. Oh, boy, that did it. Cy just went through the roof. You know, if I'd known Cy, what I know about him now, I would <laughs> never have said anything like that. <laughs> And he just went ballistic. I'm a composer. I'm a musician. I know music, and this is not music. And I, I dare you to show me the musicianship in this. And oh my God, he just went through the roof. So of course I didn't know any better, and I, I just answered him back, and I defended this position that I had absolutely no invested reason to defend, but just my way. And we ended up having a really terrific argument. <laughs> and the night ended on turning our back on each other and storming out. I went home and I remember picking up a book I had. It was an encyclopedia book and I threw it across the room. I said, I met the most infuriating man. <laughs> oh, this is great. I didn't know this part of the story. An auspicious beginning, just to say the least. And clearly, I wasn't kidding when I said you guys really were the unlikely duo. <laughs> now I understand. Yeah, he liked first. classical. <laughs> you like rap. You're a home buddy. He was a man about town. He liked restaurant fare. You talk about the fact that your passion was oaky food. I hear a song coming on here, kiddo. I mean, <laughs> this is like, you know, you say potato, I say potato. That's what exactly. it sounds like, right? But here's something. You you brought something to him that he hadn't found before. And I'm curious if you think you understand what was missing from his life before you. Well, Cy had a lot of women in his life before me. Not that he ever kissed and told. I don't really know details. I was hoping from this book I was going to get a little more, <laughs> find out about these women. And he had long-term relationships with them. But he told me that shortly before he died, he said, I am so glad, you know, they said that we're together and that we got married. He goes, but I couldn't have done it one minute before I did because I was was completely dedicated to my work. My music was everything to me. He said it would not have been fair to a woman to marry her. He said, I, I just got to the point where I thought, you know what? I've, I've done enough. I think I can turn my head from the music for just a few minutes a day. And <laughs> that's so and, fascinating. Uh, get married. Yeah, that's fascinating. But why do you think you were the one? Oh, I don't know. I think it was all in, in the stars, probably, you know, who knows? But <laughs> that's a really good question. Nobody's ever asked me that. I know he was the one for me because he was the smartest man I'd ever met in my life. He was the funniest man I'd ever met in my life. And he was infuriating. And I know I was infuriating to him, too. And, and we we battled it out, you know, up till we, when we figured out how to get along together. Uh, but no, I don't know the answer to that. I well, I'm good. I gave you something. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, you'll have to, yeah, no, you have to think about it, right? I, absolutely. Something that you said that I found absolutely fascinating about him. You said, upon landing in Paris, I told me to be very quiet and listen to the beat of the city. It's very different from New York. Do you feel it? He asked you. I love that, by the way. When I read that, I just, oh my gosh, I just got shivers. Shelby, what's it like living with a man like Cy Coleman? I mean, you just said it yourself, actually. You said that he couldn't have a woman before, a wife, because he was his music was his mistress. Was that always even after he found you, to some extent, the case? Well, living with a man like Cy was the best, most wonderful thing in the world, because Cy, I've got to just say one thing about Cy that I wanted to say in the foreword of the book, but I couldn't figure out how to get it in there, which was that Cy listened to you every word you said. He was, he would listen to anybody that spoke. You could just be the, the taxi driver. You could be anybody. And he would listen and he would think about what you just said. And then he would respond with a very thoughtful response. And he was so smart. It was, it was just fantastic. So that was the best thing about living with Cy. Hmm. Was having somebody who actually listened to you. you yeah, know? that's a gift. Yes, it is. Because and a lot of people don't listen. <laughs> Ask me. That's right, exactly. <laughs> Exactly, and you as a as a uh, radio host probably know that more than anybody. Yeah, no, that's no, I, it's true. To me, listening to people is a gift I can give them. Right? It's okay. the gift that I wish more people would give me. <laughs> so I really relate to what you're saying as to how special that made you feel. Probably, it, and yeah. Everybody around him too, and that's every single person that knew site. I'd say there's 30 people that will tell you, "Hey, Cy Coleman, he was my best friend." That too is a gift to make everybody feel like you're the center of their life. Yeah. So you're exactly. you're describing somebody who's incredibly special. As I said, you ultimately married. You married Niagara Falls. I love this. 
<laughs> you have to have, without a question of a doubt, the best wedding announcement in the New York Times I have ever read. <laughs> you know that, right? Everybody should, that. yeah, right. Everybody should go to the New York Times and read it. I wish we had time to read it on air, but we can't. But Niagara Falls, my friend, what? We were trying to figure out how to get married, and literally, so I said, "Look." Five people want to sing at my wedding. Tony Bennett, Lilius White, Michelle Lee, and he was naming all the people who wanted to sing at his wedding. And he said, we don't have that. Where are we going to put a stage? How are we going to do that? What are we going to do? Put them on the tennis court? What are we, you know? So we were starting to stress on this, and it was not fun. And one day I was watching a movie, an old movie, where they shuffled up to Buffalo to get married. And I said, Sai, that looks like fun. Why don't we elope? And he said, I don't want to deprive you of a wedding, honey. He goes, now all women want to get married and they dream about their dress and all that. I said, I don't want to deprive you. I said, Sai, I never even thought about getting married before you. I said, so it's not that important. He said, great, I'll tell you what, we'll go to Niagara Falls, get married, and I'll take you to Europe and we'll blow all the money on the best honeymoon you ever had. <laughs> so you did. Is he a big spender? <laughs> oh, yeah. When he wants to. We went to the capitals of Europe, first class hotels, and uh, had the most amazing one month honeymoon. Listen to me. This is interesting to me. We talked a little bit about living with a musician. Can they turn off the music? Can no. they not turn off the music? So is it like mood indigo? I mean, is it an opus living with somebody like him? How difficult is it? Well, I'll tell you this. He, I, could, I got to know Sai pretty well. And when he would wake up in the morning... I I knew that he'd been working in his sleep. And I'd say, did you do anything? And he goes, yeah, I wrote a really good song in my sleep. I said, how'd you know? He said, I said, your fingers move. Yeah, in the bed. They just sit there. And Seriously? They huh. On the bed next to me, yeah. Wow. And he, that's how he wrote was very cerebrally. He told me that he doesn't sit down at a piano, you know, and plunk out the notes. It's all there, 100% in his head. And he said, writing it down, that's just secretarial work. Huh, how he interesting. He that. Did he ever write a song for you? He always said, I'm going to write you a song. And then when he did the, his last album for Sony, he dedicated a song. He goes, I'm going to dedicate a song to you and Lily. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and so he did that, and I was really, that was great. So Lily is Lily Sai, now 15 years old, your yep. daughter. He was the first to raise the subject of children. He was 70, I think, wasn't he at the time? Yes. He had been talking to a friend of his who said, you know, you married a younger woman, and she needs to have an opportunity to have children. All women want children. And he came to me, and he said, you know, I never occurred to me, but my friend said, you might want children. He said, is that true? <laughs> And I said, well, honey, I said, it never didn't really think about that for us. But I said, of course, I'd like to have children. Do you want to have children? And he said, well, it never occurred to me. He goes, but now I do. Wow. Shocked you, huh? <laughs> yeah. And then he was like, oh, my God. He was a dog with a bone after that. There was going to be a baby or bust. So Lily comes into your life. Did that change him? Did that change you? Well, yes. Of course, having a baby changes. But I wish I had pictures right in front of me now to show you pictures of Cy and Lily together. Yeah, it changed him. Boy, we went from having a deal where I had to have, be home two nights a week. He wanted to go out all the time. But I had originally said, I need at least two nights at home. But with Lily, we switched it to six nights home, one night out. And he was fine with that. Really? And he, that changed him a lot. But he just took her to the theater with him. If he was in rehearsal, that baby was right there. And he just loved showing her off to everybody and, you know, just thought she was just the, the bee's knees. And we had an office. He had an office downstairs at the uh, townhouse on 57th Street. And when anybody would come to visit, he'd make sure the door was stayed open between our ho the house and the office in case she wanted to come down. He said, Lily is always welcome. And so she'd kind of crawl down there and go hang out and toddle around while they were working. <laughs> wow, I love it. I love it. I love it. I want to go back to something that you said. I mean, people. First of all, he was a, he was a people person. That was clear. I mean, he wanted to go out all the time and he was, you know, the big party guy, you know. In my mind, after reading about him as I have, it almost appeared that he played people as well as he played the piano. <laughs> That's for sure. He knew people inside and out, and he was so insightful about people. And he never got anybody wrong. I can't remember one time that he told me something about somebody we'd met, just met, that turned out to be wrong. And he had a lot of friends and very few enemies. So that's a rare thing. 
for somebody in his business. Right. He was able to get past a lot of stuff. He said, he told me, he said, never say never in show business. I put that in the book, I think, because you're going to work with them again. He said, so never say, I'm never going to work with that guy again. He said, never say that because you are. Right, <laughs> right, right. He was a man who could forgive and forget. That was clear. He, he sure could. Fascinating. Oh, Absolutely. Did he love people as much as his music? What was no. first for him? Music. Music first. He would have thrown me under a bus. Fascinating. Uh, for music, I think. I hate to say that. But so how did that make you feel? First and true, first true love. And how did that make you feel? It was fine because I knew. It was 100% I knew it. And I don't think he literally would have thrown me under a bus. But I do think he would have made choices. If it was a choice between music and me or music and anything else, he would have chosen the music. It was driving him. It wasn't a choice for him. That music was bubbling out of sight uh, like like lava out of a volcano, and it had to get out. He always made sure it got out and was constantly making sure that he would have outlets for that. Either he was going to play at a club or he was going to write another show or he was going to do a benefit, but he definitely had to be playing that piano and getting that music out there. Possessed. That was his number one priority. So what do you think was driving him? Well, that's a good question. I do. I think it's two things that were driving him. One, the music was somehow demanding to get out um, of him, and I don't think he could rest because of that, and that's just a fact. The other was, I think, it's basically that he wanted to succeed and that failure was not an option for him. Around every corner to him, he saw potential failure and that he didn't want to ever not have something going on. Hmm. He told me once, and this is this cracks me up. We're living on 57th Street at Sutton Place in a beautiful townhouse. He's uh, just had a show come off Broadway. You know, things are great. His accountant called him and said, look, you just got to tighten your belt a little. You know, just, you know, things are changing and whatnot. So that just sent him kind of into a little bit of a worry. And he, he told me, he goes, now, honey, listen, he said, I got to tell you. He goes, I got to tighten our belts. He says, now, everything's going to be okay. He said, now, don't you worry. Everything's going to be fine. He goes, because I'm a musician, and they always need piano players. <laughs> Smart guy is right. He, <laughs> he had something to serious. fall back. Yeah, no, he had something to fall back on, and he knew that no matter he what happened. It. Fascinating. That is unbelievable. Did he ever tell you what his favorite song was? No, he didn't have a favorite song. He's always said the one I just wrote. Okay. And did he ever tell you who his favorite performer was of his songs? Well, Tony. He loved Tony. Uh, you know, he loves Tony personally, and he loved what Tony did with his songs. So I'd say Tony for sure. Because Tony and he were good friends, and Frank Sinatra was fine, and, and, and you know, they weren't friends. So my, my last question is this. Oh, wait, wait, I'll, Mabel Mercer, okay. Mabel Mercer, really? I, I have to say, first of all, Mabel Mercer, yeah. Then Tony... <laughs> Wow. He loved Mabel. I'm absolutely fascinated by that. That's interesting. So listen to me. We lost him way too young. Oh, God, yeah. Right? I mean, way, way, way too young. And I'm curious as to this. He always had music playing in his brain, right? Yes. He's gone now. Does the music play on for you? Or is there just a part of you that went with him? Oh, there's a part of me that went with him. That's for sure. I'll tell you. Nobody is Cy Coleman. Nobody goes up to Cy Coleman's knees. And that is talent for sure. Uh, but the humanity of Cy, the depth of his humanity, the decency of that person, the funniness of that person, the warmth of that person, the difficulty of that person. You know, I'm not going to say it was all sunshine and lollipops, but he was very complex. And there's just nobody that can come close to that. And that's a sad, sad story. <laughs> but true. But true. But you keep the memory going, and I assume you do that because for Lily as well? Oh, yeah. I can't help it. All I want to do is talk about Cy. If you... <laughs> <laughs> I get that. I can talk about Cy. You just push the button and watch me go. I don't know, because I also, Cy was a great storyteller. Boy, he told so many stories. The best part of Cy was the fish never got bigger, if you know what I mean. Yeah. The story was con consistent. And so I love his stories. And he's got so many funny stories. He's got so many interesting stories. He's got stories that really help and shape people, young and up and up up-and-coming composers he is just he's really something and when i you say that he had lived music i think i said this in the the foreword of the book which is that he told me he had at least a couple of hundred songs in his head that he hadn't written down yet and he said some of them were pretty good wow. 
<laughs> There's always a song around the corner for him. Can you imagine having that mind, though? Seriously. No, I, I, I can't. Yeah, yeah, and I wonder. So anything that nobody ever asked you, you wish they had? Oh, was, uh, yeah, was Cy talented? Was he smart about other things? Hmm. You know, a lot of people just think he was only smart about music. But he was a great businessman. I mean, really good businessman. And real estate and all that. But also, he wanted to be, when he was a kid, he said if it hadn't been music, he wanted to be a, a reporter. Really? He, yeah, he was. He wanted to be a journalist. That that was what, he had visions of, you know, covering wars and stuff like that. <laughs> so, yeah, really smart guy. And, and he was a math whiz. He told me that music and math are exactly the same. So, he was just unbelievable at math and he only went to high school you know he he never went past high school because he told me by the time he graduated high school there's nothing Juilliard could have taught him that he didn't already know he already knew counterpoint he'd been studying orchestrations for years uh, at music and art that there was absolutely no reason to keep going to college and yet he was the most educated man I ever met I swear he knew everything a guy had gone to eight years of college did. <laughs> Seriously, he was a genius. He was a genius. And, you, and, and, and I guess, the, what's that word that I'm looking for here that I think that would probably best describe him? He was a Renaissance man. Yes, he was. Yeah, that's... Great. That's a great term. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it really is. He could have done almost anything, but if the music drove him. On the day you leave me, there still will be spring. Roses will be blue. Robins will sing, subways will be running, doorbells will ring, and all in all, the sky won't fall, the sun won't suddenly grow cold. your arm around my shoulder so let me get to my last question andy okay you spent all of this time with this man, with the people who knew him best, going into the archives. Tell me what you truly discovered that you didn't know about him going in that puts him on the unique category in the history of music. I, I think that I knew it going in, but only on a gut level, that what makes him so unique in the history of music is that I, I walked in knowing he could write in just about any style. What I'd not realized until I'd spent so much time with him and his music was how the sounds that I'd been hearing since I was a child were so refracted through so many different prisms. And so, for instance, if you listen to some of the ragtime songs that are in Barnum, or if you listen to On the 20th Century, they're not strictly trying to sound like old-time music. They have a modern, contemporary energy to them. And I'd not realized until I was knee-deep in all of this that that's what makes Sai so genius, is that these songs that sound effortless, no, yeah, that, that that's a pretty little waltz uh, using one of your favorites, Real Live Girl. And no, it has a different energy to it. And that energy and his sense of warmth and the sense of humor that I came to know through either interviews that he gave or through the people who knew him, that's all there in the music. And he's a man who I think will be surprising me even after being so intimate with him for a few years. That will be surprising me until the day I die. The colors of my life are bountiful and bold. The purple glow of indigo The gleam of green and gold The splendor of a sunrise The dazzle of a flame The glory of a rainbow Dark one day, the 
colors of my life will leave a shining light to show.